Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's a pretty interesting format for debate between people. Uh, I think Brendan was wise to avoid arguing that the Catholic Church was a force for good. I think that would have been a pretty sticky wicket to be arguing. Uh, he then strangely argued that secularists uh, demonise Catholics and demonising is bad, therefore he spent 15 minutes demonising secularists. Uh, Adnan argued, I think, uh, quite effectively that, that certainly there was a time when Islam was a, a better force for good than Christianity. I think he's right when he says that. Uh, he's way off base when he refers to Hitler as a secularist. Hitler who wrote in Mein Kampf that he was doing God's work in exterminating Jews. And Hitler who did a deal with the Catholic Church in the Reich Concordat. And Hitler who remained Roman Catholic and Hitler whose armies went into battle with the slogan God with us on their belts. Um, another argument today that secularism is a force for good for the same reason that Catholicism and Islam are not. And that is because secularism protects our politics from being corrupted by the immoralities of religion. Catholicism and Islam have two particular things in common, two particular problems in common, in my opinion. The first is that they both worship different variations of the God of Abraham, who I think is one of the most morally vacuous characters that man has ever invented. If you look at the Old Testament, the core message of the Old Testament is that this particular God tells one particular tribe that if they obey his rules, he will help them kill other tribes and steal their land. And he tells them that if they don't obey his rules, he will make them eat their own children. Now that seems to me to be a pretty bad basis on which to build a universal ethical code. And as time went on, different people have um, rewritten, I suppose, the characteristics of this Abrahamic God. In the first century, Paul gave us Christianity and the New Testament. In the seventh century, Muhammad gave us Islam and the Quran. And more recently, Joseph Smith gave us Mormonism and magic underpants. <laughs> and the common thing between these beliefs, as damaging and as absurd as they may be, respectively, is that these people do not worship different gods. They worship different versions, different evolutions of the same God. The God of Abraham, the God of immorality, the God who drowned everybody on earth apart from one family because he was upset with himself. The second thing that I think Islam and uh, Catholicism have in common that is quite damaging is that they both believe that they and only they are correct. And they both believe that because somebody wrote a book several hundred or several thousand years ago and they believe that that book was dictated by the creator of the universe and therefore everything in it must be correct and therefore everything new that they learn has to be crowbarred into being consistent with what was written in those books or else it has to be rejected. Whereas I as an atheist and every atheist I know is happy and comfortable to say we may be mistaken about anything that we assert. Give us new evidence, we'll happily change our minds. We won't retreat into uh, claims of infallibility, we won't retreat into claims of divine revelation. We'll say, we did believe that, we now realise we're mistaken, and we know something new. So let's look at where, with regard to the Catholic Church in Islam, these divine revelations have brought us the Catholic Church brought us nearly 2,000 years of blaming the Jews for killing their God. 200 years of, of murderous crusades against Muslims. About 600 years of, of pretty savage inquisitions against heretics. They, uh, in the 20th century, the mid 20th century, the Catholic Church made deals with, with fascists and with Nazis. They uh, signed a concordat um, with uh, Mussolini uh, to get their pretend state in the Vatican in return for support for Mussolini's fascist government. They signed the Concordat with Hitler in order to protect the power of the Catholic Church in Germany. And the Catholic Church in Germany every year celebrated Hitler's birthday until the day that he died. Uh, I mentioned the Inquisition. Even today, the Congregation of the Inquisition the body that dealt with the Inquisition still exists within the Catholic Church. 
It's changed its name to the more friendly congregation for the doctrine of the faith, but it still exists. It makes moral pronouncements like a couple of years ago when it said that raping children is morally equal to ordaining a woman as a priest. Now that's not surprising coming from an organisation, the Roman Catholic Church, that believes that condoms are morally worse than AIDS, that believes that they should work with the Islamic states of the United Nations to block gay rights. And a church that has not only covered up countless crimes by its own priests against innocent children in virtually every country in the world where Catholicism exists, but it has done things like bring Cardinal Law from Boston back to Rome, back to their pretend state in the Vatican to evade justice in Massachusetts. And not only that, but when they brought him back, they promoted him. Islam, meanwhile, has brought us its own set of immoralities. Starting with the massacre of the Jews in Medina after the Battle of the Trench. It's centuries of atrocities against Hindus in India. Islamic states today that treat women le as less than men, that base this on and supported by Quran verses that say that a woman receives half the inheritance of a man, that says that in certain circumstances women's testimony is worth half of a man's testimony. In fact, less than half of a man's testimony. If there are two men in these circumstances, a woman doesn't even get to give testimony. If there is one man and two women, that will uh, balance up the scales. Um, the verse that says that a man in certain circumstances can beat his wife. These are things that I, as a secularist, find morally repugnant. I've said earlier that the uh, Islamic states have worked with the Catholic Church and that do work today with the Catholic Church at the United Nations to block gay rights. They continue to persecute people uh, on the basis of having different religious beliefs or having no religious beliefs. It, even as I speak to you today, as an Indonesian civil servant called Alexander Ann, 31 year old man who worked for his government, who wrote on his Facebook page that there's no God, and the following day was beaten up by his work colleagues. I was then arrested and is now facing five years in jail for blasphemy. Uh, even as I speak today, Hamza Kashgari, a Saudi journalist, who wrote on his uh, Twitter feed that he would shake hands with Muhammad as an equal if he met him, and that there were good things that Muhammad did and bad things that Muhammad did. Um, there were calls for his execution. He tried to flee the country. He got as far as Malaysia. He was deported back from Malaysia to Saudi Arabia, and he is now facing calls for him to be executed. And if you look at all of these um, immoralities of the Roman Catholic Church in Islam, and you ask what they have in common, you'll find three things. They're directed against people who have different or no religious beliefs, or they're directed against women, or they're directed against gay people. They're not based on empathy, they're not based on compassion, they're not based on minimising suffering, they're based on following rules written down by somebody several thousand years ago because they believe that the creator of the universe dictated it. And that's why the Abrahamic religions, despite the good that they do, and nobody's disputing that they do good, but that good is inherently corrupted by religious bigotry and misogyny and homophobia. And while we can't stop people believing those things, we can keep those um, bigoted opinions out of our politics and those prejudices out of our politics. And the way that we do that is secularism, which is separation of church and state. Separation of mosque and state, separation of divine revelation and state, separation of religious bigotry and misogyny and homophobia from state. And when we separate those immoralities from the running of our state, we find that secularism is a positive force in three different ways. Firstly, it allows everybody freedom of religion, freedom of belief, freedom of conscience. 
And in fact, it is the only way to protect everybody's freedom of religion and freedom of belief and freedom of conscience is for the state to stay neutral. Because once the state gets involved on the side of any belief, including atheism, I was opposed to an atheist state or I would be to a religious state, it means that freedom of belief is compromised for those who are not part of that majority. I think it's important to stress that secularism not, is not the same as atheism. Religious states promote religion, atheist states promote atheism, and secular states promote neither. The second positive reason that, a, that secularism is a source for good is that it allows religions to focus on preparing for the next life that the believers believe that they have, based on applying their faith to their divine revelations. And it allows the state to focus on governing the real world that we live in today, based on applying reason to the best currently available evidence. And it enables Roman Catholics to be true Roman Catholics, based on the verse in their Bible that says, render unto God what is God's, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And it enables Muslims to be true Muslims based on the verse in their Quran that says that there should be no compulsion in religion. A secular state is not the same as a secular people. What we in atheist Ireland want is a secular state for pluralist people. That people are free to believe what they want in all the varieties of, of conscience and belief that arise. And that in order to protect all of those equally, the state remains neutral. And the third reason that secularism is a positive force for good is that it provides a foundation stone on which we can build a secular liberal democracy. And that in turn can combat other non-religious threats to human rights, such as fascism, totalitarianism, communism, unregulated free market. They're also dangerous ideologies, they're non-religious ideologies, but they're also often based on faith, they're also often based on dogma, and it's just as important to challenge those non-religious faiths and dogmas as it is to challenge religious faiths and dogmas. But the big difference between those faiths and dogmas, the non-religious ones and the religious ones, is that when non-religious dogmas collide with reality, and when we realise that communism hasn't worked, or the unregulated free market hasn't worked, or that fascism is, is um, just a terrible thing for so many reasons, we notice that that happens because it's happening in the real world. Whereas religion hides its promises and its threats in an untestable afterlife, and that enables it to continue on causing unnecessary suffering and preventing people from flourishing because its claims are deliberately untestable. There are also a couple of practical advantages of secularism. Um, psychological studies in the field of positive psychology have shown that um, secular states generally have happier people. The Happiest people are found in countries like Scandinavian countries, other Northern European countries. Um, secular states generally have healthier social statistics in areas like homicide, juvenile delinquency, early mortality, um, teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, abortions. The statistics for society are better in secular countries than they are in religious countries. And in America, the statistics are better in the secular states, in the Northeast, etc., than they are in the Bible Belt states, which are more influenced by religious beliefs. And the third interesting fact is that there is a there's a scientifically proven sort of pathway to secularism that has been found by a group called the World Value Survey. 
which is a team of interdisciplinary social scientists around the world that have been conducting these surveys uh, on all continents for the past couple of decades. And they're finding that human values can be mapped, most of them, 70% of them, onto two axes. One is an axis for individual people, where people can move from survival values on one side of the scale to self-expression values on the other side of the scale. And the second is an axis for measuring societal values, which go from re traditional religious values at one end of the scale to um, secular rational values on the other end of the scale. That's not my uh, terminology, that's the terminology that, that they have drawn from the data that they have been collecting. And the pathway that is emerging and is fairly consistent around the world at different speeds in different places is that when you invest in health and education and communications technology, that that enables individuals to move from uh, survival values towards self-expression values and that the cumulative effect of a large number of people moving from survival values towards self-expression values shifts society from traditional religious values towards secular rational values. So you have your people, you have healthier societies, and you have a pathway by which that happens. How long have I left? Um, you're just at 15 minutes now. Okay. Well, I'll conclude then by just saying that uh, what, I, what I started with, that I think that secularism is a force for good for the same reason that Roman Catholicism and Islam are not. Because secularism protects our politics from the corrupting influence of the immoral aspects of religion. And that secularism is separation of church and state, separation of mosque and state, separation of divine revelation and state, and separation of religious bigotry and misogyny and homophobia from state. Thank you very much.